What happens if India and China actually get into a fight? Has anything like this ever gone down before? Let's take a closer look into the complicated relationship between India and China, especially focusing on what happened on June 15, 2020. That day, tensions at the China-India border got really heated in the disputed Galwan River Valley. But here's the twist. There was no shooting. Instead, Chinese and Indian soldiers went old school, engaging in intense hand-to-hand -hand combat under the night sky. By the end of it, 20 Indian and 4 Chinese soldiers had died. This clash marked a serious low point in the relations between these two nuclear powers, placing them right at the heart of major global geopolitical tensions. In our video, we're diving into the ups and downs of Sino-Indian relations, the border clashes since 2020, and what all this means on the bigger stage of the Indo-Pacific region. China and India have relations stretching back to ancient times, but modern relations are marked by a border dispute, with both sides claiming territory that the other currently controls. The two countries share a 3,440-kilometer border, with China claiming roughly 90,000 square kilometers of India's northeastern territory. For its part, India says China occupies 38,000 square kilometers of its territory in the Aksai Chin Plateau, which runs through the Xinjiang and Tibet regions. The border dispute originates in 1947, when India achieved its independence from the British Empire. Britain's former colonial government never established a clear border with China, and the newly independent India did not do so either. China's annexation of Tibet in 1951 brought the two countries into further dispute, with Beijing claiming that the Indian territory of Arunachal Pradesh was part of southern Tibet. Despite this, relations between the newly independent India and the new People's Republic of China were cordial until 1959 when the 14th Dalai Lama needed to flee Tibet after the Communist Party crushed an uprising that sprang up in his favor. India provided refuge for the exiled Tibetan leader, earning Beijing's ire. In the autumn of 1962, a border war broke out, when, according to India, China occupied the aforementioned Aksai Chin. China achieved all of its objectives in the month-long conflict that was overshadowed by the Cuban Missile Crisis. It solidified its control of Aksai Chin and was successful in its advances in Arunachal Pradesh as well. But the abrupt end of the Cuban Missile Crisis freed the Soviet Union to supply India with more MiG-21 fighter jets. Meanwhile, President Kennedy was free to order ships from the United States Navy into the theater. Faced with the rare prospect of the superpowers agreeing on a common enemy, him, Mao had no choice but to consolidate his gains and end the conflict. However, it did not lead to a permanent settlement of the border dispute. Between 1992 and 2022, there were close to 20 rounds of bilateral talks on the issue, but none of them accomplished anything. Rather, since the war, China and India came to a passive, unspoken agreement. Soldiers from both countries would take separate days patrolling the border up to what their respective governments considered its territory. That way, Chinese and Indian soldiers would avoid running into each other. Such an agreement gave both sides a way of saving face in the situation. However, in April 2020, troops from the China's PLA began fortifying areas that Indian soldiers had freely patrolled for decades. In May 2020, tensions increased. Then, according to Indian officials, units of PLA troops entered India's line of actual control (LAC), ignoring warnings. In response to this incident, India reduced the number of visas it issued to Chinese nationals and put new restrictions on Chinese companies doing business in India. Meanwhile, China claimed the opposite, that Indian troops entered its LAC and built fortifications which obstructed the patrols of PLA troops. Also, according to China, on the fateful night of June 15th, Indian troops attacked Chinese personnel who tried to negotiate with them. Whatever the case, a new era of militarization of the disputed border not seen since 1962 had begun. This latest round of border disputes reflects the overall deterioration of political relations between Beijing and New Delhi that had been building for some time. While trade between China and India increased from a mere $3 billion in 2000 to $125 billion in 2021, geopolitical developments ensured that there would be a worsening of the bilateral relationship despite the growing trade ties. In 2013, Xi Jinping announced his Belt and Road Initiative. As part of this infrastructure plan, China created what geopolitical analysts sometimes call a string of pearls around India's neck. Chinese investments in Myanmar, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, the Maldives, Nepal, Djibouti, Kenya, and above all, India's traditional enemy, Pakistan, 
threaten to isolate New Delhi, with China increasingly dominant in the South China Sea and Indian Ocean. The infrastructure investments could also lead to military bases. For example, in August 2022, a Chinese survey ship that had been used for military purposes like tracking satellites and missiles docked at the Hambantota port in Sri Lanka. The port is currently leased to a state-run Chinese company for a term of 99 years. Defense experts feared that it could become a preview for China's militarization of its BRI investments. Chinese ties with Pakistan in particular, as seen in the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor CPEC, rankles New Delhi in another way. The linchpin of CPEC is the Karakoram Highway, which connects major cities in Pakistan, like Abbottabad, to Kashgar in China's Xinjiang province. A major part of China's BRI, the current plan is to extend this highway to the port of Gwadar, which is currently under the control of a Chinese company. For China, the advantages are obvious. If CPEC can be completed, with its accompanying rail lines, oil and gas pipelines, and fiber optic cables, it would enable China to bypass traditional maritime trade routes that go through the South China Sea, and with it, the choke points that the United States Navy and Air Force can close off in the event of a confrontation. However, CPEC's infrastructure runs through Pakistani-controlled portions of the disputed territory of Kashmir, which India and Pakistan have been at odds over since both countries achieved their independence from the British Empire in 1947. This independence was not smooth. It came with an episode called the Partition of India that killed an estimated one million people and displaced millions more, and it's the origin of the Kashmir dispute between India and Pakistan. China had once admitted this territory was the subject of dispute, but by building its infrastructure through it, it has implicitly taken Pakistan's side. As both of these countries have territorial disputes with India, it certainly appears to New Delhi to be the makings of an anti-Indian alliance. That both China and Pakistan have nuclear weapons only makes the situation that much worse for India. Hussain Haqqani, a former Pakistani diplomat who served as ambassador to the United States, perhaps unwittingly described New Delhi's views on the situation when he said in 2006, For China, Pakistan is a low-cost secondary deterrent to India. For Pakistan, China is a high-value guarantor of security against India. Naturally, India has feared that China's diplomatic and economic investments in countries like these will lead to its economic isolation and geopolitical encirclement, and this fear has slowly but surely forced it out of its traditional, non-aligned foreign policy. As early as 2004, India acceded to the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue alongside the United States, Japan and Australia. When the Quad was re-established in 2017, India was again an eager participant, as China had become much more aggressive in the years since Xi Jinping took over. As part of its Quad membership, India participates in frequent military exercises alongside its partners, such as the annual Malabar naval exercises. China has always seen the Quad as a containment threat, and India's participation in it has made Beijing view New Delhi as increasingly an ally of the United States, a participant in an anti-China, Asian NATO. Therefore, keeping India on its toes in the disputed border region is a way for China to gradually exhaust India's attention and resources while slowly but surely gaining more territory. In this regard, China's actions along the border with India in the Himalayas can be seen as an extension of the grey zone operations it's used against Vietnam, the Philippines and Malaysia in the South China Sea, against Taiwan and against Japan over the contested Senkaku Islands. According to Shashi Tharoor, a member of India's parliament and former chair of India's Committee on External Affairs on Sino-India Relations, a frequent item of dialogue for the Chinese side during bilateral negotiations is to leave the border issue for future generations to settle. This is a convenient ploy because it allows time for China's economic and military might to grow relative to India's, putting it in a stronger position to eventually force New Delhi to give in. Such a strategy would be consistent with China's grey zone operations. India has also stepped up its own international infrastructure investments in a strategy to counter China's string of pearls. The common name for this strategy is the Necklace of Diamonds, a phrase first used by Lalit Man Singh, India's former foreign secretary, in 2011. For example, India has made investments in, since 2018, the Chabahar port in Iran, a country traditionally aligned with China through the BRI. The port is located about 170 kilometers west of Gwadar and could serve as a natural staging point to disrupt the trade going through CPEC. India has also built the Deepwater Sitway port in Myanmar in 2016 and has invested in the ports of Mongla and Chattagram in Bangladesh, giving itself permanent access to them in the process. 
India and Oman have also come to access agreements for naval facilities there, such as the Dukham port. The relationship with Oman is a highly desirable one for New Delhi, as the related sites are close to the Strait of Hormuz, where 30% of the world's oil transits. The Necklace of Diamonds strategy goes further than countering China's moves in the Indian Ocean. At its maximum, it aims for a full counter-encirclement of Chinese territory. India has enacted an Act East policy as part of this plan. The strategy calls for ties eastward through the South China Sea to India's quad partner Japan and even for moves to be made in Mongolia, completing the encirclement of China. First along the chain, India and Indonesia have agreed that the former would have military access to the Sabang port, which sits at the entrance to the Strait of Malacca, which much of China's trade passes through. Then there is the Changi naval base in Singapore. In 2017, India and Singapore signed an agreement which permits the Indian Navy to receive some logistical support at this base, such as refueling. India's relations with Indonesia and Singapore allow it to create a line to its Andaman and Nicobar Islands, which host India's Andaman and Nicobar Command and its associated naval and air bases. Through this line from the islands through Indonesia and to Singapore, India has easy access up and down the Strait of Malacca. Elsewhere, India and Mongolia deepened its ties in 2016, when China hiked transit tariffs after a visit by the Dalai Lama to Alain Bhattar. India said that Mongolia could use the $1 billion credit line it extended during Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to the country the previous year as part of a way to ease its resulting financial difficulties. In 2018, India and Mongolia agreed to establish a bilateral air corridor and for Indian expertise to help Mongolia build its first oil refinery. China has also created tensions with its ethnic Mongolian population in Inner Mongolia. The province saw unrest in 2020 after Beijing limited Mongolian language in its schools. Protests erupted across the border too, with people in the Mongolian capital of Ulaanbaatar accusing China of oppressing their neighbors. This is fertile ground for India to exploit in its anti-China geopolitical maneuvers. However, there have also been problems with the Necklace of Diamonds strategy. For example, India attempted to develop a naval base on Assumption Island in the Seychelles. An agreement was signed in 2015, however, the Seychelles National Assembly never ratified it. China is in the lead in influence there. India has sold some weapons to Vietnam, a country that's also a pivot point on the Necklace of Diamonds. The selection makes sense, as Vietnam also has a frosty relationship with China due to the ongoing South China Sea dispute. The two countries maintain cordial relations and Vietnam has participated in a Quad Plus talks, but there have been no formal military or strategic agreements, which would solidify Vietnam's place in the necklace that India wants to create. As an act of self-defense, India has also attempted to counter China's bid for influence in Nepal. Beijing has lent its support to communist elements in that country, such as certain political parties and activists, while India and its Quad partner, the United States, have lent support to friendly forces there. Tensions between the two factions erupted in early 2022, when Nepal's parliament approved $500 million worth of American aid for electricity and road infrastructure improvements. Pro-China organizations staged violent protests in response, because India and Nepal have an agreement where their nationals can cross the border without a passport or work visa, New Delhi is sensitive about China's attempts to expand its influence there, further putting relations between the two countries on edge. For now, China remains in the lead in the infrastructure and strategic investment race in the Indo-Pacific region, and with such fears of encirclement, India has become even warier of China along the disputed border. With this background, the border issue flared up again and escalated. At the end of June 2020, satellite imagery revealed that Chinese troops were entrenching themselves, constructing shelters, pillboxes, bunkers, and other infrastructure on some high ground. China even inscribed a map that included the disputed area and the Mandarin name for China, Zhongzhou, as a way of demarcating its control of the territory. By July, both countries were patrolling the Pangong Lake with military boats. At the end of August, Indian and Chinese troops had a skirmish near the village of Chusol in Ladakh. No casualties were reported, but the incident put both militaries on further alert. Several incidents occurred at the Pangong Lake in September. One of them reportedly involved Chinese troops approaching their Indian counterparts with spears and rifles, which Indian sources claim was an attempt to force another hand-to-hand -hand fight like the one in June. Sometime after that, Indian and Chinese troops exchanged between 100 and 200 warning shots. Also in September, Indian troops occupied some high ground, preventing Chinese troops from altering the line of actual control any further. 
After another clash in January 2021, China and India agreed to set up a hotline, but this did not restore the pre-2020 status quo along the border. In 2022, Indian media reported that there were 60,000 PLA troops in the disputed border region. India deployed a similar number of troops on its own end. Although 2021 and 22 did not see the frequency of standoffs that 2020 did, there were at least two clashes in 2022 that did not get reported until 2024. Both of the incidents involved the hand-to-hand -hand combat scene in the June 2020 incident and came in the Ladakh region. No deaths were reported. The first incident in 2022 came in January, when Chinese troops attacked an Indian outpost. The second came in November, when Indian troops repelled what they claimed was a contingent of between 40 and 50 Chinese soldiers, injuring some of them and foiling their supposed attempt to capture an outpost. It was not clear if the outpost in question was the same one from January. In December 2022, in the Tawang sector of the Indian state of Arunachal Pradesh, which China claims as part of Tibet, there was another incident. Unlike the January and November fights, this incident was reported at the time, and it proved to be the worst since the June 2020 border skirmish. It was another episode of hand-to-hand -hand combat, with the soldiers using clubs, stun guns, or their bare hands. No deaths were reported in the fighting, but the conflict did come in a strategically and politically important area. The battleground was near a 17,000-foot mountain peak, where India has an outpost. The area also houses the largest Buddhist monastery in India. As India still hosts the exiled 14th Dalai Lama, the capture of this monastery would come with high political symbolism for China. In October 2023, China and India held a new round of talks on the disputed border. Both sides agreed to withdraw troops from a few hotspots and to continue the momentum of dialogue and negotiations through the relevant military and diplomatic mechanisms while committing to maintaining peace and tranquility on the ground in the border areas in the interim. In January 2024, at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Rajesh Kumar Singh, one of India's officials on industrial policy, signaled that New Delhi's economic restrictions on China, imposed in the aftermath of the 2020 border clash, could ease if the current tranquility along the border continues. However, given that talks just like this have not led to any resolution of the issue for decades, most international observers are skeptical that such language will do much to alter the situation. The two countries are currently in a race to build border infrastructure to shore up their respective positions. Such infrastructure not only includes field fortifications, but reinforced bunkers, air bases, missile sites, underground bases, and the roads, tunnels, and bridges necessary to supply all of these. In a September 2023 interview, Lieutenant General Rajiv Chowdhury, the leader of India's Border Roads Organization, admitted that China was in the lead in this area, but that India would be able to catch up within three to four years. Since 2020, China has fortified its positions along the border at a rapid pace. The speed of these building projects seems to have taken India by surprise. Chowdhury, however, said that India had responded adequately, completing 300 critical projects of its own, with another 60 set to be completed by the end of 2023. Although Chinese and Indian policymakers give lip service to peace along the border, these moves betray their mutual thoughts. Beijing and New Delhi both believe that the struggle along the border will continue that this remote region in the Himalayas should have emerged as such an item of global importance is also revealing of the times in which we live. A new era of strategic competition has developed in the Indo-Pacific region, with India as a major rising power and for the United States a critical counterweight to China. Therefore, the disputed border means much more to the world than it did in 1962. Back then, with the world's axis turning on Washington and Moscow, a border war in the Himalayas had little prospect of creating wider geopolitical consequences. With the emergence of China and India as nuclear-armed centers in the global balance of power, that is no longer the case. Although it's not as big of a flashpoint as Eastern Europe, the Korean Peninsula, the South China Sea, or Taiwan, the world's highest mountain range is now a hotspot that's far more important than its population and economic output would otherwise suggest. What do you think is coming next in the dispute between China and India and for relations between the two countries as a whole? Will fighting break out again and could it escalate? What broader effect would another border war have? Don't forget to let us know in the comments. Also make sure to hit the like button and subscribe to the channel for more military analysis from military experts.